Uh, and I invite you to turn this morning to 2 Corinthians 11, verses 16 through 31. Uh, our passage this morning feels uh, pretty personal to me, and I'm betting that a number of you will join me in that personal feeling as we go on. This morning, we're going to hear the same frustration we heard last week in Paul, only this time, rather than being frustrated that the Corinthians don't believe he actually loved them, he's shifting gears to how frustrated he is that they've decided abusive people actually love them, the super apostles. You're going to hear Paul talk about how physically, verbally, and even legally violent and oppressive the super apostles were. And if you've ever been abused by a church leader, as I have and a number of my friends have, or especially if you've ever watched someone you love be abused by a church leader or even just abused at all, you're going to hear Paul talk with a confusion and a frustration and even a fear that's going to be familiar to you, certainly familiar to me. But what you're also going to hear Paul offer is an entirely different approach to what a healthy relationship between church leaders and church members should look like. A relationship not based on strength, but on what Paul will call weakness. And the reason why Paul wants the Corinthians to realize the situation they're in isn't only to protect them. I mean, it is that. He loves them. He wants to keep them safe. But what he wants most is for them to leave those abusive leaders and come to the ones who will help them heal. See, Paul here isn't saying just get out, get away from there. He's saying, please come back here because here with us, you'll find Jesus and you'll find Jesus's healing presence. And at a time when there are lots of stories about abusive church leaders, including in our own denomination, unfortunately, this word is a very timely word. If we are going to be a place that's safe from abusive behavior and that brings healing to those who have endured abusive behavior. And so all I want to look at today from our passage is the kind of abuse the Corinthians were encountering, think a little bit about why they put up with it, and then end with the kind of leadership Jesus wants for his people and why. And we're going to do that under those points that are on the board for you there. Uh, so let's read 2 Corinthians eleven sixteen to 31 this morning, pray, and then we'll look at uh, these three things. And like last week, I'm going to try and read it with the same emotional intensity that it was clearly uh, written with. So uh, for 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 16, Paul says, I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, Accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes lest one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me 
of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. Thus far, the reading of what can only be God's own word. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning asking that you would bless this word to us through your spirit so that we would hear of the kind of leadership that you call uh, us to exhibit here at Grace and that you yourself show in our Lord Jesus Christ so that we would recognize your gentleness and be drawn to you. Father, we pray now that uh, your spirit will go out with your word and give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to believe uh, what you are telling us. Father, we pray that the words of my mouth is your preacher, and that the meditation of all our hearts is those called to hear and receive and respond to your word, that it would all now be pleasing in your sight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start by noticing that Paul begins in a very surprising way. He begs them to listen to him boast about his own ministry experience and qualifications. Uh, That Paul should need to do this in a church he planted probably surprises us, but that Paul thinks he has to do this in order to start breaking the Corinthians of their infatuation with the super apostles, that clearly surprised Paul, and it clearly made him really uncomfortable. Did you hear him say in verse 17, What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Uh, We could follow uh, Eugene Peterson and translate this more idiomatically this way. I didn't learn to talk this way from Jesus. I learned to talk this way from those foolish super apostles and those who love them so much. And here I think it's important to ask, why does an apostle writing an inspired letter feel the need to not talk the way that Jesus taught him to, but instead to talk like a fool? Like, why talk like a super apostle? Why boast, especially when it clearly made him uncomfortable? I think the answer is found in verse 18, where he says, Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. And what that means is, You've been hearing a lot about the really amazing works done by the super apostles, and not so much from the people they've helped, which as we've seen in our series, isn't that many. No, you've been hearing about it from the super apostles themselves and the people who've attached themselves to their very flashy ministry. Uh, These super apostles get up and they tell stories about the crowds they've gathered on the street, about the packed stadiums, about the people they brought to tears and how much money they've raised. We've been very successful, they tell you. And you can hear in the background, I think, subtle comparisons, or maybe not so subtle, to other ministries that just aren't as flashy, particularly Paul's and Titus's. As we've heard them say, Paul couldn't financially support his ministry locally because he's an inept manipulator. And he didn't fill stadiums, he's not a great orator. And Titus can't seem to get the church to unify around a central vision of ministry. How effective of a leader, how effective of a pastor is Titus really? The reality is, my friends, when we see things that appear obviously successful in terms of size and in terms of money, uh, we get enamored with them and with the people who do them. This is something that's just true about human nature, and you can see it throughout the Bible. We're attracted to and we love winners, especially when those winners offer the security of <clears throat> excuse me, size, fame, money, and influence, all the things that the super apostles were trying to get the Corinthian church to get from them. Now, I want to be clear, those things are not bad in themselves. Sometimes God grants them to certain ministers and churches historically, Charles Spurgeon had an influential, sizable, very famous ministry. So did Martin Lloyd-Jones, and in our day, Timothy Keller has one. But we also know that those things can hide some very sinful behaviors. And that's exactly what it was doing with the super apostles. 
Paul goes on in verses 19 to 20 to level some devastating accusations. He says, For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. And I don't, you know, there's always a question of like tone. What tone did you read? An angry tone, a happy tone, an ironic tone? I think this is like a pleading, deeply emotional, why aren't you listening to me tone? For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves, for you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. So it's really frustrating. Commentators will talk about this verse as though it's a rhetorical device. And you'll see this in commentators all over the place. They'll say things like, Paul uses violence as a metaphor to describe the spiritual damage done by the super apostles false gospel and the way they delivered it with such amazing rhetorical clarity. Sure. But what if it's not a metaphor? I mean, the reality is this isn't a metaphor. He's being very clear about what they are doing to the church. He says the super apostles are making slaves of them. Now, there were plenty of ways to do that in the ancient world. Slavery in various forms is very common. The two most common were to get someone thrown into jail, which would make them a chattel slave of the kind we think about when we think about slavery. Or you can make someone a debt slave and make them and usually their children and their children's children have to work off what they owe you. See, one of the reasons for sort of endemic slavery in the ancient world is that it took lifetimes to pay back financial debt. And if you go back and read 1 Corinthians, you would see that there were rich Christians who were exploiting poor Christians by suing them. And the result of, those, of losing those lawsuits would be either debt slavery or potentially chattel slavery. And I can't help but think that what started off, you know, in 1 Corinthians has now come full bloom in the super apostles, abusing them by suing Christians in the church who weren't going along with what they wanted to do and literally making them their slaves. But not just that. Paul talks about devouring them. The only other time that he uses that word is in Galatians when he talks about how the church will devour and destroy itself if it keeps dividing into camps and attacking each other. In one of those verses, it just has no immediate application to our reality that I can see. Paul says, watch out, for if you keep biting and devouring one another, you will destroy each other. It's amazing how, like, unapplicable the Bible is, right? <laughs> one of the things that abusive people do is they create groups, and then they pit those groups against one another, and that keeps everyone off balance so that they can keep power. They divide in order to devour. It's what Satan does. Take advantage of you means just that. They use you as a rung to step on as they wake, make their way to their next goal, which is, of course, more power. Put on airs means they publicly treat you like they are better than you. How does putting on airs work? Well, there's a number of different ways to do it. The most common one and the ones that I found referenced most in sort of like ancient literature around the day would be insults, put downs, and pointing out your flaws in public. So to put on airs would fall under what we would today call verbal abuse. Tearing down people in public in order to make yourself look better and to destroy them. And then the last one I think we all recognize, strikes you in the face means they hit you in the face. It's physical violence. These super apostles who were raising huge amounts of money, getting access into influential positions in the halls of power, packing out stadiums, were using the legal system to enslave some of the Corinthians. They were dividing the church, using the saints for their own advantage, breaking them down publicly with their words, and if all else failed, they would hit them. That's clearly abuse. My question is, why did the Corinthians put up with that? And, and why do other Christians, like, what is it 
about abusive ministries that makes it so hard for some people to leave them? And I know there's a lot of answers to that question. I know it's a a very nuanced thing. But I think there are two reasons that sit behind the text this morning that we can drill down on. The first one that I think made Paul feel like he had to stoop to their level of boasting in order to start prying the Corinthians from these abusive super apostles is that the power abusers have can ironically make the people they're abusing feel safe. And people will tragically say, yes, their strength hurts me, but it also protects me. It keeps me safe from people or situations who scare me or who might hurt me. And it clearly must work because look at how safe they are. Look how safe their strength keeps them. There's a lot of fear in the Corinthian church right now about How do you take in this individual who's deeply hurt us? What if he hurts us again? We've talked about that in a number of sermons at the very beginning of the series, which feels like a long time ago. What if I submit to these abusers? They'll protect me from him again. If he hurts me, they'll beat him up. That's one reason there's one more. We all know how scary it is when people we love go down dangerous paths or when people we love don't change from their sinful habits as quickly as we think they should in order to keep them safe. And abusive leadership can actually seem to create an avenue for quick change because doesn't power compel change? And again, ironically and tragically, out of fear for those we love, we can be tempted to submit them or even submit ourselves to abusive people in order to get rid of a particular sin or to prevent a particular outcome. We've talked about how there's a number of people in the Corinthian church who are struggling with poverty. We're talking about how there's a number of people in the Corinthian church who struggled with uh, unrepentant sin. Well, maybe this person just needs to get hit or devoured by division in order to get them out of poverty or to end that drug addiction or to get them to repent from the damage they've done to the people in their lives. They just need a good, solid whooping. And so what Paul is doing here in this section of the letter is three things. He's exposing what's really happening. He's saying like, hey, if they're hurting you, they're not actually helping you. He's also acknowledging that weakness feels like being defenseless. And he's reminding them that Jesus helps us not through power, but through our weakness. So that we don't need to be afraid of weakness because Jesus is actually in our weakness. And he's going to really drill down on that as the letter goes on. And we're going to look at that much more closely next week. But how does Paul do all of this in this this section of the letter? Well, having exposed the abuse, which we've looked at, Paul goes on to really focus in on the things that make him weak, that make him different, and Titus different from these super apostles. He says in verse 23, he's a better servant of Christ than the super apostles. And even saying that sentence, even writing that sentence clearly made him uncomfortable, right? Like, I'm talking like a madman. Like, who says these things? (laughs) But he's a better servant of Christ, not just because... His ministry produces Christ-like love, like we talked about last week. But also because in his servant to Jesus, Paul, service to Jesus, Paul has to rely on God's power. Because as he goes on to say in the passage we're going to look at next week, God's power is made perfect in weakness. But that's for next week. So you have to come back to hear the rest of that that section. Uh, This week, just look at the things, the list of things that Paul calls his greater service, the things that make him weak. So unlike the super apostles, he's not putting people in jail, but in verse 23, he's put in jail for people. He's not hitting people, he's being hit by people, for people. Paul isn't dividing God's people and devouring them. Instead, he's suffering greatly in order to put them together. 
uh, receiving from the Jews 40 lashes minus one, the shipwrecks, being adrift at sea, walking on dangerous roads, being hungry and cold and stuck out in the rain and the sun. That's all missionary work. Uh, Paul did that in order to bring the gospel to the nations so that they could repent and believe in Jesus and be united to the people of God through the Holy Spirit in love. It's about taking what's broken and putting it back together. And in that way, Paul suffers for them. And then notice too, rather than being concerned with his own fame as the super apostles were, Paul is concerned for the faith of other Christians. Did you notice this sentence, which I don't think we should spiritualize away? Paul calls it the pressure of anxiety for all the churches in verse 28. The pressure of anxiety. Paul spends part of his days worried about other Christians' relationships to Christ. I think we could say prayerfully worried, but still, it rests on him like a weight. He's worried about the health and unity of the congregations of Jesus and about protecting people he loves from abusers like the super apostles. And he's not so much worried about what happens to him. He's worried about what happens to you. And the point I want to draw from all of this is Christ-like love is always going to have some appearance of weakness. Because Christ-like love exposes itself to difficulty and even sometimes to danger in order to love people like Jesus loves them. Abusive leaders want to shield themselves from danger by making you suffer in their place. Christ-like leaders want to shield you from danger by suffering for you, and if they can't, then suffering alongside you. And the idea of suffering for you and alongside of you leads me to my last point. It's based on verse 29. Paul says, Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? So here, Paul was reminding them of what he wrote in 1 Corinthians where he says that in order to win their hearts to Jesus, he tried to become all things to all people, including becoming weak to those who are weak. And what Paul meant is that he would come alongside people where they were at and walk with them. He would deny himself things he liked in order to help them meet Jesus. He would expose himself to their heartache so that weeping with them as they wept, they could one day rejoice together in their new relationship with Jesus created by faith. He's also reminding them that the thing that really gets Paul angry, which is, kids, what indignant means. It means to be angry. What got Paul angry is when Christians are tempted to fall away from Jesus by people in the church. Or when they're not allowed to experience one of Jesus' blessings like forgiveness because of people in the church. Or when non-Christians are prevented from coming to Jesus by people in the church. Right, when Paul talks about people being made to fall, he has that in mind. And by the way, that's probably a reference to Jesus' own ministry, where Jesus said, if any of you cause one of these little ones to stumble or fall, meaning Christians, it would be better for them that a millstone would be hung around his neck and thrown into the sea. It clearly makes Jesus mad too. Paul was also indignant when people fall on account of the ungodly actions of the church. And here I think Paul is trying to gently remind them that not only does true Christian ministry suffer for you and suffer with you, but also true Christian ministry wants to protect you and protect each other, not hurt you. After all, Corinthians, how many of you were weak And Paul joined you in weakness, and that's how you met Jesus. How many of you were kept at arm's length from the blessings of Christ, and Paul went to bat for you? If you go back and read 1 Corinthians, you'll see that through empathy and solidarity, Paul brought the gospel of Jesus to those who were hurting. 
and by stepping into conflict with humility and truth and with prayer and by enduring the weakness of suffering, Paul brought the blessings of the gospel to Christians who were being denied those very blessings. You see, my friends, strength may be necessary occasionally for protection, like when God uses his strength against Egypt in the Old Testament to defend Israel from its first attempted holocaust, or like when God had to use his strength to stop Israel from exploiting the poor and weak in the name of Jesus. But let's be clear about something. According to the Bible, strength does not produce repentance. It does not produce faith. It does not produce maturity or love. And anyone who says otherwise is either lying or is just deeply confused. How do we know that? Because God doesn't use strength to save us. He uses weakness. He used a baby born homeless and a homeless ministry and a death on a cross. How does God tell us he brings about repentance and faith? He tells us in Romans 2 verse 4, it's the kindness of the Lord that leads you to repentance. That's explicitly what Jesus says. He does it through mercy, which takes judgment on our behalf. He does it through forgiveness, which does not inflict you know, tit-for-tat wounds, but bears suffering so that we can be made whole in himself. And he does it through the indwelling spirit who walks with us, even when we're not so easy to walk with, who grieves with us, who rejoices with us. It's the humility and gentleness of Christ that saves us. It's all the things that Paul labels weakness. Now, I know some of you are going to go, but don't you have to be strong to be that weak? Yes, obviously you do. But the point is, you are strong so that you can bear with other people and forgive them, not inflict things on them. Mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, that's what brings faith. That's what brings reconciliation. That's what brings life, because that's how Jesus brings it. And on that note, I want to end this way. My friends, if you've been abused by church leaders in the past, I want you to know that that wasn't Jesus, and that wasn't ministry that Jesus has blessed. But I also want you to remember that Jesus was there with you. He was also abused by leaders, church leaders, in his earthly ministry, and he is with you in your suffering too. But I also want you to see that the road out of abuse and pain into healing is not found in rejecting the church, but in finding a church where Jesus' empathy and love and kindness and patience is being expressed. And you'll know you found it if you find a church where people are vulnerable because they love each other. If you find a church where people worry about one another's relationship to Jesus and text you about it, and call you, and annoy you. Hey, miss you on Sunday. How are you doing with that struggle? If you find a church where the leaders suffer with and for the people, and where they repent if they fail to do that, because unlike Jesus, none of us are perfect. That's a healthy church. That's a place where Jesus is. And it's a place where healing and growth will happen. Maybe not rapidly, but really and truly. I want us to be that kind of church. And as more and more stories of abuse service, I think we need to be that kind of church. We need to be a healthy Christ-like place with Christ-like leadership where Christ's healing can be experienced. And so let's pray that Jesus would make us into that kind of place and would help us express the weakness of his forgiveness and mercy and kindness and patience to everyone who walks into these doors. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you lead your people by suffering with them and for them and uh, that you protect them and love them so perfectly. 
Please help us here at Grace to join you in the way you shepherd and minister to your people. Uh, Please help us, especially uh, me as the pastor and the elders and the deacons, to minister like you do. And Lord, please, as we all seek to be kind and humble and patient as you are, by reliance on your grace, bring healing to those who have suffered. Uh, Bring peace to those in conflict. Bring forgiveness to sinners. And bring us all hope through the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask this all in his name. Amen.